Well, we are entering hour seven of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, and we're going to attempt to cover in one hour what I'll call the monarchy. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, and first and second Chronicles. These, this is the core, in a sense, of the historical books. And uh, I want to remind you that our whole review of the Bible is based on exploiting two discoveries. The first is that the Bible is an integrated message. These 66 books penned by over 40 guys over a period of virtually 2,000 years is an integrated message, meaning that every detail there is by design. And if, once you discover that, of course, you come to another discovery, and that is you can demonstrate that the origin of this very carefully crafted message is from outside our dimension of space and time. Once you discover that for yourself, it'll just change your whole perspective of what this book is really all about. And so the central theme, of course, is the Old Testament is the account of a nation. That's basically what it's about. The New Testament is the account of a man. The Creator became man, and His appearance in our history is the central event of all history. And He died to purchase us, and yet is alive today. And our most exalted privilege is to know Him. And that's what the Bible is all about, and that's why you're here in this review. Now, we've been going through uh, the whole panorama of history, starting with the creation, the fall of man, and so forth. We went through the book of Genesis, which took us all the way up to, but not including the Exodus. The rest of the T Old Testament, in, in, a, in a historical sense, goes from the Exodus to the exile, when the house of Judah finally goes into Babylonian captivity. And there are about 400 years then that are sometimes called the silent years between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. And the New Testament, of course, occurs all in one lifetime. But uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to focus on the monarchy, Saul, David, Solomon, and, and right up to the exile. The rise and fall of the monarchy. First and second Samuel and, uh, is, uh, obviously, Samuel is the bridge between the period of the judges and uh, the kings. And... Uh, we call it First and Second Samuel. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, speaks of the First and Second Kingdoms. Instead of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, they have First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kings, in a sense. And the Latin Vulgate follows that same pattern. But we, of course, will stick to the more traditional thing of First and Second Samuel, which is followed by the pair of First and Second Kings. And uh, they will include David's 40-year reign, and then Solomon and the tragedy of the division, divided kingdom, the division of the kingdom. Finally, leading to the exile, the, 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 the wipeout of the northern kingdom and the exile of the southern kingdom. And uh, First and Second Chronicles is a recap of much of that history from the point of view of the southern kingdom, from Judah. That's the, 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 the southern kingdom, of course, the one that produces David, and David is, is you know, in the messianic line. So it's obviously a, a primary significance here. So... The monarchy, Samuel and Saul and David, Solomon, southern two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. The southern kingdom outlasts the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom goes, gets destroyed, and the southern kingdom goes to, into, into captivity. First Samuel covers Samuel and, and uh, Saul. Second Samuel covers David, and uh, then Solomon will be picked up by first kings. And... Uh, between first and second, first Kings and Second Kings, we have two the prophets. In First Kings, you have Elijah, very colorful character, and a more soft-spoken but equally colorful character is Elisha in Second Kings. But you can think, if you remember the division between First and Second Kings is Elijah and Elisha, that may be helpful in trying to keep your bearings here. And First and Second Chronicles is essentially a recap from Second Samuel right on through the Kings. So uh, we'll be going trying to summarize all of these. First Book of Samuel. Samuel's the last of the judges, and of course it covers his birth and his youth, his call to office, and various times and acts. That'll lead up to Saul, first of the kings. His appointment as a king, his promising beginning, and yet his later folly and sin. He started off great, but uh, not good news. And that, when you get to the uh, 15th uh, chapter of first book of Samuel, you we encounter David, who is the greatest of the kings. He's, of course, anointed by Samuel, and he will have, he's, 
He will have service before Saul. He doesn't replace Saul well, uh, and, until he's, Saul dies. But he's uh, uh, at first in service to him. And then uh, as Saul gets jealous, envious, so forth, he, he uh, endures a, a, as a fugitive. So Samuel is quite a guy, only, equaled only by Moses. And uh, he really ends, in a very formal sense, the period of the judges. The period of the judges is, uh, is that uh, strange time. It's actually a time of decay, tragically. Um, but what, one of the things that uh, Samuel also does is he heads the order of the prophets. He actually founded what they call the schools of the prophets. We don't know a lot about that. We hear it alluded to several times, but we, we don't know a lot about the details. But Samuel, of course, places Israel's first king on the throne, and uh, he later will anoint David. Many people have a misconception. They have a feeling that, uh, that uh, uh, a king for Israel was an afterthought. Uh, the people wanted a king, and so God reluctantly gives them a king. Uh, that's not really a very uh, proper perspective. Because we know in the book of Judges, in, uh, first of all, in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 38, we saw David's genealogy already anticipated and encrypted there. And also in the book of Ruth, we have David's genealogy. The problem with Israel is they wanted a king right now. David wasn't ready. So God says, you want a king? I'll show you what a king's all about. And give him, gives him Saul, and they, they uh, later regretted it. But in any case, uh, uh, we'd, anyway, we have David anointed. And even as a, guy, a kid now, he's going to confront Goliath. Most of you know the story. But he ultimately has to flee Saul as a fugitive. And uh, there is, of course, a threat of the Philistines. The Philistines originally came from Egypt, went to Crete, then from Crete. They came there along the coast of Israel. Um, and they oppressed Israel for 40 years. They were the, the, is, the enemies of Israel. The word Philistine in Latin is Palestine. The land, the land was named by the Caesar in order to um, disallow any Ju uh, Jewish presence in, in the, the second century. But when you use the term Palestine, what it really means is Philistine. And they were the enemies of Israel for over 40 years. Now Samson, who has a lot of colorful pranks that he plays, um, really just had only tactical successes. When he dies, the tribe of Dan, uh, which was responsible for that region, was not able to hold it. And they end up moving on their own initiative up into the northern part of the country. It's interesting that the Ark of the Covenant was lost to the Philistines, but for a short while. And boy, did they end up regretting it. In fact, one of the most colorful episodes in the Scripture is when the Philistines capture the Ark and every place they put it, and there's, they had five cities. In each of the cities where they had it there as a hostage, they had sickness and problems. They had uh, 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 infestations of rats that were associated with that, and they had, and they had uh, an outbreak of hemorrhoids, strangely enough. And they finally conclude, after having in each of the five cities, that they need to send it back. And one of the most humorous, in, in 1 Samuel 4, one of the funniest chapters in the Bible, because they, when they go to send it back, the priests realize they can't just send it back without an offering. So they decide to put in the ark, sort of a, a restitution kind of thing. They, just, they put five gold mice, one, one for each of the five cities that had been plagued by all these problems. But the funny part, and it's in 1 Samuel 4, is that they... Uh, also put in five golden hemorrhoids. <laughs> now, I have no idea who crafted those. <laughs> I have no idea who served as a model for them. <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> and they turn this loose and they find their way back, by the way, inter interestingly enough. So the ark was not a blessing to the Philistines. Um, they ultimately are defeated under Samuel's leadership. And they do, though, they do continue as a major nemesis for Saul. The Philistines were ultimately subdued by, of course, by David. And uh, so one of the things that uh, the people do, though, they clamor for a king. This is an example of self-determination. And uh, see, God had promised them kings from the beginning. You'll find it in Genesis 17. 
uh, in Genesis 35. And as I say, you find even uh, the, the genealogy of David in Genesis 38, encrypted behind the letters. And uh, you also find it in the book of Ruth, it's explicitly laid out. And, uh, but the people want a king. In fact, in 1 Samuel 8, they clamor for a king to go out before us to fight our battles. That's what they're claiming for. They want a king to help them win battles. Big mistake! Who was fighting their battles up till then? God was. The Lord was. Now this is a request that, we, that really is, there's some lessons here in self-determination. We're a culture that uh, encourages being self-determined, freedom of action, on the one hand. And yet, um, there's a danger of being self-determined instead of being God-led. And uh, this request that comes to Samuel came from a committee meeting, not a prayer meeting. And uh, Samuel, of course, is really upset with this clamor. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, the Lord explains it to Samuel. He says, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. This is God speaking to Samuel. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God views this as a choice they've made, that they would rather have an earthly king than a heavenly Lord. And we can stand here as spectators and be very critical. Boy, they should have known better. And yet, be careful when you look in the mirror. How many of us do the same thing? How many of us try to take charge of our lives rather than to submit it to prayer and to the Lordship of the Lord? Say, the Lord's my Savior, indeed, but is He your Lord? Big difference. Big difference. Is He really the Lord of your life? Well, David, of course, encounters Goliath. You all know the story. This is later, of course. Now, this guy, Goliath, was a formidable guy. I assume he was on the local basketball team. He's nine feet tall. <laughs> he was not only large, his profession was combat. He's a prof he, he, was a, he was trained. It's interesting, you know the story, how David is upset because the troops are terrified as this champion comes forth to settle the day, and no one will go up. And, and uh, David's there on other errands as just a child. But he says, if they'll do it, I'll go. And Saul's going to give him his armor, but David quickly realizes after he can't, he can't handle that as heavier than he is. He's going to handle it his way. He was a, he's a shepherd, and he was skilled with a sling. And uh, so he crosses the brook and picks up five stones and puts it in his pocket. And you all know the story how he took a stone and nailed Goliath right between the eyes. And when he fell, he took Goliath's sword and cut off his head. The question that you can ask yourself is why did David pick up five stones? Did he think he's going to miss? No, it turns out, when you study the scripture, you'll discover that Goliath had four brothers. And once you realize that, you realize what David was ready off for the whole gang. And I think that's kind of fun. The other four are ultimately, several chapters later, uh, taken care of by, by then, by David's mighty men. But uh, he was from a family of five, and you'll find that in 2 Samuel 21, much later. But uh, it's there in the scripture to dig out. I might explain, by the way, Goliath was a descendant of Anakim. He was a, ne he was a descendant of Nephilim. So this is a, a vestige of uh, things that were going on in the land when uh, God told Abraham that his, his descendants would return to the land of Canaan after 400 years, that gave Satan 400 years to lay down a minefield. And there are four primary tribes that uh, are mentioned in the Scripture that, uh, uh, that were Nephilim in which jo Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child of these certain tribes because he's got a gene pool problem. Anyway, out of this, of course, comes the hybrids of the Anakim. They're called Nephilim also, even in Numbers 13. And uh, the Zamzuman is one of them. That's the one from whom Goliath descended. But anyway. Well, um, the, uh, this, of course, this uh, caused public awareness of David and uh, that there is a deliverer in Israel. And uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a whole bit of rivalry that begins to emerge with Saul. And so David becomes, a, on the one hand, a deliverer and a chief of Saul's men of war. He also becomes a devoted friend of Saul's son, Jonathan. And the two of them become very, very close. And uh, in fact, one place it says their souls were knit together. They were, they were uh, very, very... Uh, Saul, uh, Jonathan 
despite the fact that David was a rival, in effect, of his dad, still um, regarded it was very loyal, a good friend. So Saul's an interesting study, by the way. In fact, it's interesting to contrast Saul and David. Saul was the kind of guy you and I would want to pick. Very striking physical superiority. And initially, very modest, very forthright, very direct, very generous. You see, his early qualities, he showed a lot of promise. But in his life, as in ours, the big issue is finishing well. Finishing well. Boy, you could keep a logbook on that one. And he later, of course, Saul later declines. He, be, he, he gets uh, fraught with irreverent presumption. Uh, he was a Benjamite from Gim- Gibeah. He, he, in fact, he sets his capital there. Remember, remember the Benjamites were the group that closed the book of Judges with all the, those uh, 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 almost wiped out by the other tribes. And uh, so, but Saul was very impatient anyway as a king. Um, the Philistines were arrayed against Israel, and he was supposed to wait for Samuel at Gilgal. But he ends up violating the priest's prerogative and offering prearranged sacrifices to the Lord. He wasn't supposed to do that. He intrudes on the priest's office. Big mistake. And uh, so he, uh, then he finally you know, ca- calls the priest for guidance, rushes off, and so forth. Very impatient character. And uh, uh, he, was suppo- he was supposed to wipe out the Agites. Agites. He fails to do that. When Samuel finds that out, he's really upset. One, if he had wiped out the Agites as God had told him to, which he didn't, you would not have had Haman in the book of Esther. Haman was a descendant of Agag. Very interesting, by the way, you're going to see a little later, David has, there's a guy, Shimei, that is harassing David. And his troops want to wipe him out because he's, running, he's throwing stones and yelling curses. And David won't let him do it. David's feeling if God called him to curse, let him curse. Leave him alone. Because David spared Shimei, a descendant of him was a guy by the name of Mordecai. So when you study the book of Esther, as we will, but the point I want, you'll pick it up then, but the two protagonists there, the one that's the bad guy, shouldn't have been alive if Saul had done what he's supposed to. Mordecai wouldn't have been alive if David hadn't spared Shimei. Kind of interesting. There's a whole thing going on. So uh, anyway, Saul's decline, of course, irreverent presumption, willful impatience, and of course his disobedience, deceit, and failure to destroy the Amalekites. Big deal. He was supposed to do that. Samuel told him to. God told him to. He didn't do it. When Samuel finds out, he's really upset. Samuel finally does kill the the king of Agag. But apparently there's a line because um, Haman descends from that. But then we have a very peculiar episode that uh, should come to mind every time you have, every, every year at Halloween. Um, you know, Christians are always sort of at a quandary what to do about Halloween. Because obviously it's... A, it's a, a, um, I love what uh, Pat Patriciana, Jer- President of Jeremiah Film, said one time. He says, asking a Christian to celebrate Halloween is like asking a Holocaust survivor to celebrate Hitler's birthday. But we do always have a problem around that season because the kids want to do something, and yet we're not trying to inc- inc- you know, encourage the witchcraft. I'm very intrigued that in the state of Washington, one of the school districts there, canceled Halloween because it was unfair to the witches to promote such a stereotype of Wicca and so forth. Boy, I can think of a lot of reasons to cancel Halloween, but that takes the cake. But in any case, <laughs> one of the things that uh, gets our attention, of course, is the strange issue of the Witch of Endor. And one of the suggestions I'm going to make is that it could make a, v- a very interesting play for high schoolers or teenagers to put on because you've got the text in the, in the Bible. Um, we had a contest many years ago of who could write the best play that was bibli- biblically accurate and, and uh, you know, attractive as a piece of entertainment and so forth. And uh, we had Frank Peretti and a number of others uh, judge the entrance, and we took the f- top four, and they're available from our office for the asking for those that want to take on a project like this. But in any case, the Witch at Endor, a very strange event, because um, um, Saul in desperation, to, because he can't get hold of Sam, Sam has passed away, and he's so used to having someone to talk to, He needs to talk to Samuel. And so even though Saul has made witchcraft illegal, wiped them all out, he knows there's someone, there's still an underground, and he gets his men to, they know there's a witch, apparently a medium down at uh, uh, Endor. So he goes goes in disguise down there. And uh, so uh, she brings it. And when Samuel comes up, she's shook. So what's going on isn't what she's used to. People argue, well, who was it really? Uh, I believe it really was Samuel. 
And it's interesting that Saul doesn't see Samuel. He only hears it. Because Samuel says before he dies, when he, when he upset with uh, Saul about um, uh, Agag, he says, You'll, you will see me no more. And if you read the text carefully, I believe he just, he hears. Samuel comes up, but the, he hears him. He doesn't really see him. In any case, um, the witch, of course, is shook because she, then she realizes something's going on. She suddenly realizes that he's the king and so forth. But, uh, it's, uh, it's, but the, what Samuel predicts to Saul, that tomorrow you'll be with me. In other words, his death. And Saul and his, and, and his, and his people were, were killed the next day at Gilboa. So uh, it's a very, very spooky scene. Many people argue about the details, but uh, it makes a very, very interesting uh, thing to dramatize, particularly around uh, Halloween, sort of the spirit of the, the, the time. But let's go back to the, the monarchy. Uh, Samuel and Saul, of course, is first Samuel. Uh, David and the second Samuel. And so in the second book of Samuel, d- starts to talk about David and his triumphs. And uh, he is picked as the king of Judah. When, you see, when Saul's dead, uh, the, 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 the time is open. He's actually been anointed by Samuel long before. But, you know, it's, with, with, uh, and David had several opportunities to kill Saul. He would not because he's still God's anointed as far as David's concerned. And it's a very colorful event when uh, Saul happens to be sleeping in a cave and didn't know that that was the same da- cave that David was hiding in. And David, while he was sleeping, cut off the hem of his garment. The next day from the top of the hill, he shows that he could have. Saul's pretty shook. Why the hem of the garment? Because the hem is where all the authority is. So we have authority on the, on the a sleeve, typically on the military or on the shoulder or something. In, the, in those in ancient Israel, it was on the hem. The hem had the genealogy, had the authority, etc. That's why he cut the hem off. He cut, it, cut off his... In fact, he later, uh, even David repented of doing that. That's why the, the, uh, the woman of the issue of blood wanted to touch Jesus, the hem of his garment. The hem was... Where the, in the sense of the authority. Anyway, whole study about hymns you can undertake. But at Hebron, he's uh, uh, picked as the king of Judah. That's just the tribal picture so far. But, uh, for, and he, he rules at se- for seven years as, as the head of Judah. But um, uh, uh, at Jerusalem, he will be picked also the king of the whole nation, king of all Israel. And uh, his identity with Judah never goes away, of course. In fact, later on with the civil war, the northern tribes... Lead, take the, a, a different tack with Ephraim as the spokesman for the north. But anyway, he's, at this point, uh, David is the king of all of Israel. He reigns that way for 13 years. And, uh, but he has troubles in his family and in the nation. And the last part of the second book of Samuel details all this. And obviously, uh, he's accepted by the king over all Israel. And uh, because of the human kinship, we are, bone and, and, uh, of thy bo- we are of thy bone and thy flesh. He also is picked because of his proven merit. Thou lettest out and broughtest in all Israel. These are all the accolades they're giving him when they pick him as to head up the whole thing. And uh, also he's a divine warrant. The Lord said unto thee, Thou shalt be captain over Israel. And the word captain there is the top leader. We think of captain as a flag rank. No, it's, I mean as a, uh, company rank, a company grade rank. No, it's a, it's a, here the term is top guy. But when you get to 2 Samuel 7, it's one of the most important chapters in your Bible. You want to be very sensitive to this. Because 2 Samuel 7 affects everything that follows. Not only in the Scriptures, in the history of mankind. And uh, this, is the, this, is when, this is the divine confirmation of the throne in Israel. And this has more to do with than just Israel alone. Because this will ultimately be the throne from which the entire planet Earth will be ruled. And uh, God there declares the perpetuity of the Davidic dynasty. Now, do you know anyone that is a direct, is a, a descendant of David? Only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so, but anyway, the Davidic dynasty is, is, is here de- de- uh, declared uh, perpetu- you know, through perpetuity. And something else is that the Davidic covenant is unconditional. We talked about the Abrahamic covenant being unconditional. The Davidic covenant also is unconditional. Very important point. Because this has messianic implications. This is crucial not just because of the governess of the nation. It's critical because it leads to the whole, backstops the whole concept of the Messiah that started in Genesis chapter 3 and climaxes with the marriage supper of the Lamb and so forth in Revelation 19. 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting verse 11, The Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house, speaking to David. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, 
I will set up thy seed after thee, and I will establish his kingdom. And he, that is David's son, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So the Davidic throne is, the dynasty is here endorsed by none other than God himself. And uh, he goes on, he says, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So his, his throne, his kingdom, and his house. Those are three different things, but all related. Each one is established forever. Key point. And this perpetuity is confirmed throughout the Scripture. In Psalm 89, His seed also will I make to endure forever, and His throne as the days of heaven. And a few verses later, Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and His throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. And it goes on. The whole psalm you know, goes on that. So, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 30, you know, I've adopted the convention here. I use the little scrolls. When it's Old Testament, I use the parchment. When it's New, just as a way to alert you that we've switched from Old and New Testament. But in any case, Acts 2, 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So Jesus Christ is the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of that commitment that God gave David. So here are the key points you want to remember from this very, from 2 Samuel 7. The divine confirmation of a throne in Israel, the perpetuity of the Davidic dynasty, that the Davidic covenant is unconditional. And all this has messianic implications because in Matthew 1, verse 1, the first verse of the New Testament, speaks of him as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Both are pivotal issues. When you get to Revelation chapter 5, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. One's the tribe, one's the family, but there you have it. And of course, it's all the way through. I just picked a couple of checkpoints here to, to make the emphasis. So the scarlet thread continues. Remember we started with the seed of the woman, and that was the race, if you will. The human race would be the means by which God was going to redeem the creation. And not just the race, but for, through the nation, it was started with Abraham. And uh, not only the nation, but the tribe of Jacob and the family of David. So God is focusing. From Genesis 3, it's the race. And from Genesis 22, we know it's this, for through Abraham. And from Genesis 49, we know it's the, the house of Jacob and then a tribe of Jacob, and then uh, under uh, David, of course, we have Second uh, Samuel. So we got, and as God focuses His revelation of how the messianic plan is going to work, that allows Satan to focus his attacks, and we'll see that all the way going all the way through. Now David was quite a guy. We tend to focus on some of his stumbles, but he was a very, very shrewd general, a very victorious warrior. And he subdues the Philistines to the west. Saul never was able to do that. The Syrians, the Hadadezer in the north. The Ammonites and Moabites in the east and southeast. And the Edomites and the Malachites in the south. So on each of the major fronts, he succeeds and subdues. Clever general. He's a man of war. In fact, that gets to him, actually, before it's all over. But in addition to being a great general, he also was a very constructive administrator. We miss that because we focus on his person and so many other things, but... Um, he was a very, very skillful manager. He brought just judgment and justice to all the people. That is quite a statement. That is quite a statement. And he, among the many things that he organizes, one of the things you want to be very sensitive to is he organized the priesthood. The priesthood was getting very large by now. The priesthood was not all the Levites. The Levites was the whole tribe, but within that there were descendants of Aaron. But even that, quite a number. So he organized the priesthood in tw into 24 subsets, or what they call courses. And each course officiated from, Shab from Shabbat to Shabbat. Each Shabbat it would change, and there was a sequence. And the 24, uh, it's one of the rare places the number 24 occurs in the Bible. The number 24 is indicative of a priesthood. 
And uh, it, that becomes a very material point when you get to the book of Revelation because there are 24 elders sitting on thrones. So they're both kings and priests in some respects. And so there's a whole thing we want to get into then. Um, the priesthood is, of course, of the house of Levi, uh, the tribe of Levi. The royal tribe is the tribe of Judah, and they are separate. The kings were not to intrude on the rights of the priests. That's what Saul made a big mistake that he paid for. Um, likewise, the, the priests were not to rule. They were priests. There's only one guy that you first encounter, at least, that's a king and a priest. That was Melchizedek. In fact, he's used idiomatically to make that very point in the book of Hebrews, chapters 5 and 6. And even, even that would probably dis uh, disappear in obscurity except for Psalm 110 where, it's, where God promises the Messiah there, in effect, that he will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not Leviticus, which was a temporary priesthood that dealt with, but to be a, a king and a priest. There are only three people that are kings and priests. Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and who else? You and me. We are kings and priests, Peter tells, uh, says in his letter. So you need to understand there's a distinction there that's very, very critical. And you do want to understand who the 24 elders are when you get to Revelation 24. It's a very important identity. It's not free of controversy, but I think it's pretty clear as to who they are because they, they tell who they are. But David, just give, going down his resume here a little bit, he not only is a victorious warrior, great general, he's also a very creative and constructive administrator, but he also is a, not just a poet, he is a major poet and songwriter. And uh, he wrote a large number of the book of Psalms. The next session we'll be exploring some of those, get that perspective. He didn't write all the Psalms, but he wrote a, a, an awful lot of them. But David's turning point, of course, is his great sin. And one of the things we obviously need to be very sensitive to is the obvious honesty of the Scriptures. They don't paint David as having no faults. They record his successes, but they also record his stumbles and failures. And uh, he, of course, we're all familiar with the story with Bathsheba. He not only committed adultery, he arranges for the murder of her husband. This is heavy stuff. And this is the king that we're talking about. And this was not a little one-night stand, a little stumble. This was the result of a process. It usually is. First of all, he was in a mode of very prosperous ease. When things are going well, watch out. When you are at the peak of your success is when you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable two places especially, at the bottom and at the top. Both extremes are danger points. And he was prosperous. He was supposed to be at war with his troops. He's home. And it was not a case of him looking out the window and seeing this gal for the first time. If you really do your homework, you'll discover that there was a family relationship. I mean, the, the, uh, these are people that, uh, this was not an initial encounter, his first encounter of that kind probably, but I mean, it was not a stranger we're dealing with here. And uh, the other thing with David, though, he was already showing signs here because he was becoming very self-indulgent. We all tend to do that. Something else to be guard, on guard for. Accumulating wives was forbidden in Deuteronomy 17. Forbidden for kings to accumulate wives. And, of course, he ends up having this affair with um, Bathsheba. And he gets of course, uh, confronted by Nathan, the prophet, in which he has deep remorse and repentance. To his credit, he has remorse and repentance. In fact, Psalm 51 is famous because that's David's psalm as he grieves over the sin that he is guilty of, especially the sin against God. And that's one of the reasons God can say in 1 Samuel 13, and it's also recorded in Acts 13, that uh, David is regarded by God as a man after his own heart. You know, when he says that, it's sort of startling. Because here's David. He's a sinner. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. How can he be a man after God's heart? Because he's honest. He owns his sin, acknowledges it, repents of it. God has a lot of room for a repentant sinner. We're all sinners. And... Uh, um, that's what, that's what the whole issue is as far as our relationship with God is concerned. So that starts, though, 
years of suffering. Remorse and contrition did not obliterate the consequences. God may forgive you for the fornication or adultery, but it doesn't get rid of AIDS. It doesn't get rid of uh, unwanted pregnancies. It doesn't get rid of the consequences of sin in, 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 the, in the natural. But uh, so David's family then becomes just a whole saga of incest, fratricide, intrigues, and ultimately rebellion and civil war have their seeds in David's sin. And uh, you know, it's astonishing. People speak of victimless crimes. They speak of crimes that, you know, really have no victim. There is no such thing. Because this is a crime against anyone that loves you. It's a crime against anyone in whose love you abide. And so um, sin, sin multiplies. Because of, his, of all these things, he's not allowed to build the temple. God says, your son Solomon will build the temple. David says, in effect, no problem, I'll just pay the bills. So David, most people don't realize this, David prepaid much of the cost of the temple. Not all of it. Solomon was very prosperous too. But uh, he actually prepaid. He really made a lot of the money. He couldn't build the temple, but he could arrange for a, a lot of the, the, the needs. And, and Solomon's glory, it follows, of course, uh, is in large measure due to uh, David's preparation for that. But there were troubles in the family. Now, something else, you know, you talk about uh, the sword shall never depart from thy house, Second Samuel 12. The sword shall never depart from your house, David. Um, one of the things as you read through the, uh, the intrigues, you'll discover that there's this old character by the name of Ahithophel that's a counselor to Absalom in his rebellion against David. And what doesn't come through, unless you do a little bit of homework, you sort of wonder, what ha why is Ahithophel so available to David's enemies? And you have to connect some dots here, but you'll discover if you connect the dots that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. And you begin to realize that he never forgave David's violation of Bathsheba. Um, so the first son of Bathsheba, of course, dies. And then uh, there also a loss of moral authority. Amnon raped David's daughter Tamar, another seedy episode. Absalom kills Ammon. So there's all this going on in the family. Finally, Absalom leads a rebellion against David. And he's counseled by this Ahithophel character, which... The Bible doesn't make clear unless you connect the dots. You discover who was his father and who was that father. And it turns out it's the father of Bathsheba. You realize that he's the grandfather of uh, Bathsheba. So anyway, um, finally Adonai Adonijah attempts to seize the kingship from Solomon. And so it goes on and on. So we've got a, a whole seedy thing here. And that leads, now we're into 1 Kings. We've gone, bear in mind, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings are 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Kings in the, in the Greek and in the, in the Latin. But Anyway, we'll stick with the traditional one here. And the first Kings will close with the antics of this incredible character called Elijah. A very colorful character. And uh, so the first book of Kings is, can be called really discontinuous through disobedience. The, 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 they're starting to have real problems. Solomon reigned for 40 years. And the uh, first book of Kings deals with the accession, the temple being built. And it's the peak of Israel's fame and glory in the days of Solomon. But he also turns apostate. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that leads to declension and, and finally decease. And uh, the kingdom finally divides because when he, Solomon finally does die, his son ex, uh, Rehoboam takes over. But Rehoboam does some ill-advised uh, increase of taxes and other things that gives the excuse for Jeroboam to peel off in a rebellion. And he, he, uh, uh, Jeroboam organizes the northern kingdom. And... Uh, the southern kingdom is called Judah. The northern kingdom is called Israel. And when you're reading the Bible in this area, you need to be careful what it says Israel, whether it's talking about the northern kingdom or the nation as a whole. We tend to use the term Israel for the nation as a whole, and that's appropriate. But there's a period there where Israel, the house of Israel, was the northern kingdom, sometimes called Ephraim. Not, it was more than just Ephraim, but Ephraim was the, the primary spokesman tribe, if you will, of that group. And Jeroboam, of course, leads them to idolatry for a number of reasons. And, and uh, the, it, it is uh, in the northern as an attempt to get the northern kingdom straightened out, Elijah is there primarily ministering in the north and has some very colorful episodes. For a period of about 80 years, the divided kingdom 
continues there before it finally goes under. But Solomon, we talked about David. Let's talk a little bit about Solomon. He acceded the throne when he was 15 years old. And they did have a lot more responsibility at very early years for lots of reasons. But, uh, and uh, so that's according to Josephus, by the way. And uh, Adonijah attempted to preempt, but he was thwarted by Nathan the prophet. So he doesn't, he's not able to pull it off. In fact, David, on his deathbed, instructs Solomon to clean house of a whole bunch of overdue punishments. And that would include Joab, Joab had previously murdered Abner. And uh, so David says it's time to deal with Joab. And there's also the Shimei issues and some other issues that he, he goes through a little checklist, punch list, if you will, for Solomon when he takes the throne. And then, of course, the big event in Solomon's career is the building of the temple. And uh, the cedars of Lebanon were famous, and, and uh, they're much more attractive than the coarser sycamores that were typically available in the south. So arrangements are made. Uh, Hiram is the king of Tyre up there, and he had a very close friendship with David. It was his friendship with David that really sets this all up. But uh, so the cedars of Lebanon were purchased by David for the temple. But something that most people don't notice is that the design of the temple was given to David by God Himself. Most of us assume the temple was just Solomon's rendering in more elegant terms of the basic architecture of the tabernacle. No, it's more than that. In fact, there's some architectural features to the temple that go beyond what the tabernacle had, besides just being larger and so forth. And it's important to understand that that was God-given. And uh, I'll show you why in a minute. But this project of building the temple, the first temple as we might call it, had over 183,000 workmen, 30,000 men, 10,000 uh, per shift in a month, uh, 70,000 carriers, 80,000 hewers in the mountains, and over 3,000 supervisors. That's a bunch of, bunch, that was a mammoth, mammoth project of the temple. Now the architecture of the temple is worth studying. You, 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 when you look at this, you'll recognize right away it's very similar to the tabernacle in its concept. The tabernacle is 75 feet wide, 150 feet long, if we accept a foot and a half for a cubit, which is pr reasonable. Um, this is much larger, much, much larger, and of course a permanent structure, not designed to be portable like the tabernacle was, which is designed for the wilderness wanderings. But the architecture is very similar. As you enter first, the first thing you encounter is the Holocaust altar, the altar, or the brazen altar, except this was larger. And around it are ten lavers of bronze for the washing. There's also a molten sea, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but a huge, huge basin, seven and a half feet deep and about ten feet in diameter, that the, that the, the, the priests would be able to uh, do ritual uh, cleansing in. And when you go through all that, you then enter the holy place itself, that first rectangular edifice. As you walk in, instead of a menorah, a, a seven-branched lampstand, there are ten of them in there. And then you go a little further, there are not, not just a table of showbread, but ten of them. So everything is, you know, the decimal points moved over, so to speak. And then just as you did in the tabernacle, you encounter the golden... Uh, uh, altar, or the altar of incense. It's always associated with the Holy of Holies. Many people assume it's in there. No, it can't be in there. It has to be tended day and night. So it's out, and they couldn't go in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest, only the high priest could go in the Holy of Holies, and only once a year, and only after great ceremonial preparation. But as part of that edifice was the golden altar, which was just outside the veil, but regarded as part of the Holy of Holies, um, we have the golden altar, the altar of incense. And as you go through, uh, when you could, if you could at least in your mind's eye go through that veil, you there would find two things, not one. Many of us stumble on that. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, was in there. But on top of the Ark is a separate appliance, a separate piece of furniture, so to speak. And that's the mercy seat. And uh, we often regard those together. It's instructive to be sensitive to the fact that the Scripture always deals with them separately. In fact, strangely enough, the mercy seat is a superior element to the ark. In several places, the Holy of Holies is described as the place of the mercy seat. Yes, it's the place of the ark covenant too, but, but it's the mercy seat that's preemptive here. So that's the, that's the quick picture of the thing. But there's something added that's not in the tabernacle. And that's a porch in front. And in front of the porch there are two other objects, two bronze pillars. These are huge bronze pillars that have nothing on top of them. They're not bearing, they're not weight bearing. What are they there for? And furthermore, they have names. 
uh, <coughs> the, uh, to the one to the one side to the south it's Yachin, and to the uh, north it's Boaz, and uh, Yachin means uh, in his counsel, what the word means, and Boaz means in his strength is what the term means, and these these are these are uh, very provocative. Something else to be sensitive to: everything outside the temple itself, the the Holocaust altar, the molten sea, and these labors are all bronze, as are the pillars. Everything else, everything inside is gold. So there's a distinction right there. The, the, everything that's inside the, the, thing, uh, the, holy, the holy place and the Holy of Holies is gold. Around the outside of the temple structure proper are wooden chambers. And these are very, very interesting um, elements. They're called headers. These were the private storerooms for the priests. This is where the priests could keep their personal things. And this is also where the priests would keep their secret idols. This was, this was, this, this was, these were closets that were supposed to be, that needed to be cleaned out. And uh, so, um, uh, so, this is, so th this is a subject of a great deal of discussion here shortly. And uh, this personal storage for the priests. Now, so we have the Holy of Holies, the most inner sanctum. We have the holy place, and we have the porch, which is a new element, and we have the inner court, and of course the outer court outside. So those are the main things that are obviously very similar to, but slightly different than the tabernacle we were familiar with. Now it's interesting that seven times in the Bible it says, ye are the temple of God. Seven times that's mentioned. Now that might be just being used metaphorically, because you're the temple of God in the sense the Holy Spirit indwells you, that may be all there is. And yet, it's interesting that it's seven times in the text. And if you, if you take the view that I do, that that's deliberate and it's part of the design, then it also turns out to hold the key to our software architecture. You know, if we talk about architecture of a building, I think most of us have a feeling for what that involves. If you talk about architecture of a computer, that's also hardware. You've got memory, you've got processors, you've got element, you know, identifiable chunks of it that have functional relations to one another. And they're easy to, I could sketch it out and it'd be easy to understand because it's tangible. What most people, unless you're in the trade, have no idea is that there's architecture to software too. See, the thing that controls a computer's behavior is not the com hardware, it's simply the environment that the software runs in. It's the software that determines what it really does. And uh, now it's interesting, you and I are the same way. Uh, we have uh, an architecture. And we speak of terms all the time that really relate to that architecture. Heart, soul, spirit, mind. What do these things mean? When I say have heart, I'm we're, not, we're not talking here about the organ that pumps the blood. We're using it metaphorically or idiomatically in another sense, aren't we? But what do we really mean? You know, um, in some sense it's like having guts, in some sense it's volition, some, a, the word can mean different things to different people. The word soul, what is a soul? We, we can make some guesses, we have some sort of feeling for it, but what does it really mean? And spirit, the scripture itself, Acts 4 says, or Hebrews 4, it, it, the, 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 only the word of God can discern between the soul and the spirit. A psychologist can't. There's a very interesting problem, if you have a computer, can you map the architecture of the software in the computer? And the answer is no, you can't. Because you can't go uphill. Because you, you, design, you, rep, you design that into a language, the language is then implemented, and by the time you get down to what they call machine language, you can't go uphill. Not generally. There's some exceptions, but not generally. That's why you have a software industry. That's why you can go to a computer store and buy some software and use it all you like, but you can't change its design because you can't get at it. You don't know how it's organized. That's what protects the intellectual property. Down in the guts of that, there's some proprietary know-how that's embedded in the code. The code's there, you've got it, but you can't unravel it because you're, it, it, it's, it, it, someone is trying to, under, if you're trying to understand my computer from the way it behaves, you'd be frustrated. You can't get at its architecture. That's the same dilemma a psychologist has. He can only infer how you're organized, how you're organized, by the external behavior. He doesn't get a chance to. Only God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart, the Scripture says. 
You can't get behind it. So the only way you can understand the architecture is to get the designer's manual, not the owner's manual, the designer's manual. And uh, that's exactly what we have in front of us, in our laps. We have the designer's manual. And he has given us the architecture of our software. And the heart, soul, spirit, mind, these are important terms because you can't keep the greatest commandment unless you know what they are. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your spirit, all your strength, all your mind, whatever. These things are important to know. So I'm indebted to my wife who spent 20 years researching this, checking out each word in the Hebrew and the Greek for each of those terms and, and tracking that down. We even went to uh, Israel, went to the uh, uh, Rothschild Museum, uh, uh, Library and Museum and so forth to do research here and got a lot of help. And uh, she was the first in my mind to really perceive the parallelism between the struct, the architecture of the temple and the architecture of man, the arch ourselves. The outer court is similar to the body, but inside that is the soul. And then the heart is in the real core and the spirit is in the Holy of Holies. They're analogous, if you will in a number of ways. And what's the porch? That's, the pl that's where the volition is expressed. That's where there's willpower. That's where you make choices. Because you notice that the Spirit dwells in us if we're believers, right? How many knew that? Sure. Okay, that's what the Scripture says. Okay. Why don't we see it more evident? Why doesn't our behavior demonstrate that the Spirit is in us? You, follow, you, see, you see the dilemma. It's not that the Spirit isn't there, it's that we throttle it. Because we make our decisions, do we make our decisions from sight or from faith? Do we make our, do, see, we make our deci the decisions are made in the porch. Are we letting the Spirit lead? Or are we responding to soulish or bodily appetites? And then there's this interesting area called the headers, the storehouses. And the more you study this, both in terms of the history with the priests, but also in its other aspects, it seems to be correlative to the subconscious. And uh, uh, it's interesting that much of our memory is obviously organized below the conscious level. We've all experienced that. Gee, what was the name of that guy in school back then? I don't remember. And then 10 minutes later, it just popped in your mind, right? Because you're subconsciously, you've got a process going on to find it. If you've been in college and you have a difficult problem, you, you, uh, most of you have discovered that if you, go th if you review the problem before going to bed and you wake up in the morning, you often have the answer. It's clear. There's all kinds of evidence. This, goes, this is not Freud. Freud was obsessed with all that. No, no, it goes way, way back. It goes back to Augustine and others. The, 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 the awareness that there is a subconscious process in our mind is, is, is very evident. That's also where we hide things that affect our behavior. And they're part of... Uh, 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 spiritual hygiene, if you will, is to clean out those closets. And the Holy Spirit will help you do that. But we need, we need to, there, there, if you're interested in this area, there's a trilogy of books. The core book is The Way of Agape. And the second one of that series is Be Transformed, which really goes into all of this. How to actually take these concepts and insights and translate them into a personal, practical impact on your Christian walk. And so I don't want to spend the rest of the time. We've got to keep moving here, but, but that's uh, uh, an area. Another thing I want to bring out, is the Bible inerrant? You know, most of us in this group, of course, take, accept the fact the Bible is the original trans, uh, uh, texts are free of error. Well, I used to say that a lot when I was a teenager, and I ran into a guy who said, what about 1 Kings 7.23? 1 Kings 7.23 speaks of this big, huge bronze laver or bowl or molten sea. It's, it's, it's trans, molten meaning it's cast and sea being a... a, 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 a full of uh, water. Uh, it was 10 cubits in diameter and 5 cubits deep. Five a cubits about a foot and a half. But the problem with that verse 23, it says the circumference is three times the diameter. Now any schoolboy knows that can't be right. That's, that's technically in there. Not a big deal, but it's wrong. Every schoolboy knows that uh, the diameter, that, that the circumference is not three times the diameter, it's pi times the diameter. Pi is a very peculiar number. Uh, most people may not remember it was 3.14159265358979. But most of us in school either use 3.16 or 3.159 or often 22 sevenths, three and a seventh as approximation. And that's what most of us did in school. 
But it certainly isn't three times. And so part of the problem, this is not a big deal, but the accusations made by the skeptics, look, there's an error in the Bible. Well, I didn't know how to answer this. I just had to accept it until I got into graduate school and whatever. And a rabbi happened to point out something interesting to me because I had trouble with this. Here's the molten sea, 10 cubits from one brim to the other, and it was round all about, and its height was 5 cubits, and a line, 30 cubits, did compass it round. Oh, it's circumference. In the Hebrew, it's misspelled. The, the Masoretes, when they found a word in the text they were copying that was apparently wrong, they didn't correct it, they marked it. The, and, the part, and they put in the margin what apparently was the correct version. The mistake, apparent mistake, or the error, or the variant, I'll call it, was called a kathif. And the correct version was called a kiri. And what's interesting when you study this, you also need to understand that Hebrew, like both Hebrew and Greek, are distinctive in that every letter in the alphabet has a numerical value. And that one of the applications of that fact is that they would add up the numbers on a page, and if it didn't add up to the one they were copying, they would burn it and start over. They didn't try to correct it. In other words, they were really very rigorous. The rigor of the scribes is something to be really applauded at. And that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were discovered, in the, had a complete copy of the book of Isaiah, and I think there were four letters different. Over hundreds of years and many copies, because of the rigor and the, uh, the commitment of these, of these scribes. It's a commitment to perception. Per, uh, 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 perfection. Well, if you go through these letters, it turns out that the kathiv, that is the written variation, is a kapf of av and a, and a he. And the way it should be spelled is just with a kapf and a vav. Now, a cup and a vav would be, the, the, the value for Kiri should be 106. But here they've added a he at the end of the word. Now, you can't even tell because it's just a breath. It's like putting the h at the end of a word. Often does you can't tell it's there in pronunciation. But the he has a value of five. And by the way, the he is also the breath or spirit too, by the way. It's, it, but that's a whole other thing we'll get into some other time. So Kiri should be 106, but the way it's spelled is 111. And when you apply that correction to the text, it says that the circumference is 31.415 and so, some other things. In other words, we have a circumference of 46 feet that is expressed with an error of less than 15 thousandths of an inch. And that's a lot better than we would have gotten if we'd used 22 sevenths as a, an approximation. The precision is frankly astonishing. And so a little spelling lesson. I might mention just in passing that there's another place that pi appears in the Bible text. It's one, pi is one of the dimensionless ratios. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth is Genesis 1.1. And uh, if you take that in the Hebrew and you take the number of letters times the product of the letters and divide it by the number of words and, and times the product of the words, you get pi to four decimal places. That's rather bizarre. There's another place in John 1.1. 1, 1. If you do the same thing with John 1.1 1, 1, you get the value of E the base of Napierian logarithms, another dimensionless constant in the universe, uh, to four decimal places. But let's move on. So that's pi. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know what you do with that. I just throw it in there to, you know, no extra charge. Okay. Solomon was personally very brilliant, but he lacked moral vigor. Very bright guy, but he lacked commitment. He was, of course, excessively self-indulgent. There it goes again. So historically, he, he, he ruled at the peak of Israel's prosperity. The Queen of Sheba visited him because she'd heard rumors and couldn't believe it. When she gets there, she found out that the half wasn't told her. Very famous event. The affluence, the su commercial success of Israel. The peace, they enjoyed peace. There was no war. They really were, it was at their peak. But it's interesting how Solomon is always, later on hist historically, always referred to adversely. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these lilies and so forth. It's always used as a measure, but in an adverse sense. It's very strange. There are many parallels people try to draw between the millennial reign and Solomon's reign. But there's also some strange hidden negatives. It's interesting that there were six steps to his throne. It's interesting that his salary was 666 talents a year. Uh, in fact, the 666 only appears twice in Scripture. Twice it appears as Solomon's salary, and of course it takes a, a, a fabled implication from uh, the 18th verse of Revelation 13. But uh, So Solomon really represents the zenith of the kingdom. They owned uh, Mediterranean uh, all the way to the Euphrates, they, uh, they, uh, from the Red Sea uh, and Arabia to Lebanon, and uh, 
The tributary states were held in subjection. The Canaanites became peaceable subjects or useful servants. So they were subjected. And uh, the immense treasures that were on David were supplemented with excessive, in fact, oppressive taxation. In fact, that's where Rehoboam makes a big mistake. When Solomon dies, he even increases the taxes worse, and that leads to the, to the, uh, the uh, rebellion. So we have the literature of success. The foundation was in the Torah. We have the history from Moses to Samuel at this point. We have the patriarchal teaching of Job, and we'll get to that in the next session. We have the theology of the Psalms in the next session, and the practical wisdom of the, wisdom of the Proverbs, primarily uh, Solomon's. And then we have the mystical suggestions in the Song of Songs. And so this really sets the stage for the next session we'll be getting into. Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,000 songs. And uh, he also wrote a great deal about natural history. And we'll see a glimpse of some of that in the writings that we do look at. But he failed. Because Deuteronomy 17 says that Israel's king should not multiply wealth, horses, or wives. And he did all three. He did all three. He traded in chariots and horses. That's what Megiddo was at one time, was his primary trading base. He indulged many foreign wives, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Whew! from the very nations that uh, uh, he was warned against trafficking at all in. Can you imagine a guy with a thousand women on his hands? I don't know how many had PMS at one time. I can't just, I just, yeah, I just, um, he must have been exhausted. Of course, obviously, many of these were just uh, political alliances and things. And, uh, and concubines were like a, was like a second-tier wife kind of thing. She wasn't, uh, there was, there had rights and things. But anyway, um, but as a result of all of this, he, it's in his regime that false gods are introduced and false worship. This is where the nation starts downhill because of its carnality, because of its false worship and the rest. So Solomon's self-life had had its full swing. In the end, he was turning away sad and sick of it all. And he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, which most people do not understand, misunderstand it. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes is actually not a pessimistic book. That may surprise you. That's his reputation. Well, we'll wait until next session. We'll take a look at it. But anyway, there's apostasy starts. He, he, he himself falls into apostasy. His excessive taxation, of course, alienates the affections of the people. And that's why Jeroboam had a good uh, uh, opportunity to rebel when the time came. He was led astray by his wives. He had temples built to several, to Shemosh, Moloch, and Esteresh. The different, uh, these are the, the idols of Moab and Ammon and the Sidonians. Sidonians to the north and Moab and Ammon to the, to the east. On the temple grounds. This was an offense. And of course, his adversary stirred up rebellion. And among the tribes, Ephraim in the north becomes one of the primary... Uh, uh, layers of the of the of the, those that are you know disenchanted and disaffected. So First Kings eleven says, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. And that's exactly what was what was that was what was predicted. That's what happened. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. See, so in deference, because of David, he's gonna, it won't be him, it'll be his son that's going to bear all the grief here. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. The tribe of Judah. So we have the divided kingdom. Rehoboam's folly, of course, is that he, his, his, his advisors told him to raise the taxes even more, and he did, and that was a dumb move. And that was Jeroboam's opportunity. And so he established alternative worship centers up north for idol, idol worship. And that, that, that was a political move, religious of course, but political because he wanted to break Jerusalem's hold on the people. And so we had uh, two uh, golden calves put up, one in Dan in the north and one in Bethel in the south. And uh, so, uh, really bad news. And we know from Second Chronicles that the, when that happened, the faithful in the north migrated to the south to stay faithful to with temple worship. Those in the south that were apostate anyway moved north where it was politically correct. And that's recorded in chapter 11, 2 Chronicles. So. so the nation split in two. The northern kingdom under Jeroboam called itself the house of Israel, and the southern kingdom under Rehoboam called it the house of Judah. 
He says he just had one tribe. That's a little misleading because Benjamin had already been folded in and so is Simeon. So you've got Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon, and then the Levites join also. So you've got four of the twelve south already. So you begin to notice right away that the ten lost tribe thing is, is, is naive and, and, and not, not biblical. But in all of this, Elijah shows up and, uh, uh, in the last chapters of 1 Kings. He had a ministry to the northern kingdom. The New Testament speaks of him more than any other prophet. Interesting character. He appears twice in the New Testament. He actually appears at the transfiguration at uh, Matthew 17. He's there. Moses and Elijah are there with Christ and, and uh, Peter, James, and John. But he also appears, I believe, in Revelation 11. There are two witnesses there, and for reasons I'll cover when we get there, I think he's one of the two witnesses. And it's interesting that Elijah did eight major miracles. He suspended rain for three and a half years. And also there's this big confrontation on Mount Carmel where fire comes down and so forth. And the suspension of rain and the fire are two of the four powers that are, alluded, uh, that are associated with the two witnesses. That's one of the reasons I make that identity. And he also is raptured. He's translated into heaven in 2 Kings 2. Interesting guy. But you, have to, you can't talk about him without talking about Queen Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. She was the wife of the king Ahab of Israel. And she is, there are allusions made to her in the New Testament. You need to understand her history to understand what those allusions mean. Her, she becomes synonymous with crafty, cruel, malicious. And I won't make any allusions to people on the political front of that kind, but we'll go on. Naboth, there's a strange little incident that occurs with Naboth's vineyard, but I believe it's very, very significant because I believe the, the, uh, the letter to Thyatira makes allusions to this. Naboth was a little guy who had a little vineyard, and it was not much, but it was his. The king wanted it, and Nahab just refused to sell. I mean, Naboth uh, just refused to sell. Ahab wanted it, and Naboth didn't want to sell. So Queen Jezebel says, hey, let me handle this. Okay. So she has an inquisition, finds some accusers that accuse him falsely, and has him executed. She holds an inquisition to get him killed, and then so the king can have that vineyard. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like a period of history that we all know about called the Inquisition? First Kings 21, you can check it out. Well, anyway, um, there's a famous confrontation at Carmel, Mount Carmel, where Elijah confronts the the queen's 450 prophets. There are also 400 prophets of the groves, so there are actually 150 guys there. And let's, let's have a contest. You have your place, I have mine, and you set up your, you set up your thing and let, let, let you call your God to start your fire. Okay? They, just, they go for that. They decide to do that. And I'll do the same. We'll see. You can't, let's, see let's see who wins this one. And they go through their whole routine, all morning right up to noon, and as they keep cutting themselves and doing all their ceremonial things, nothing happens, of course. And it's really a funny thing to read there because uh, Elijah is making fun of them. Maybe your God is hard of hearing. Uh, gee, uh, maybe he's relieving himself. Uh, you know, so uh, that's actually what he's saying. It's hidden a little bit in the King James translation. When they're all through, Elijah takes some stones and sets up an altar so it's no, no, no man, no, no tool. You know, it's a, the raw stones. Puts a trench about it. Has, puts all the wood there. But then, you golfers will understand this, he wants a handicap. So he douses his with water. Three times! And calls God, and the fire comes down, starts it, and obviously proving that God is God. But Elijah seizes the opportunity and slaughters, goes after and slaughters the priests, the priests of Baal, Jezebel, Jezebel's own. That doesn't please Queen Jezebel at all. There's some so we have a, he challenged Baal to match the altars and sacrifice. He mocked them openly, doused his three times, and then slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal. And uh, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And he went through, of course, and made his point. Well, that brings us to really 2 Kings and this interesting guy called Elisha. Elisha has a quality in Hebrew called chutzpah. He not only wanted to be the successor to Elijah, he wanted twice as much of the Spirit. So <laughs> that's chutzpah. But the second book of Kings is actually the most tragic national record ever written. Uh, the first ten chapters are the annals of the northern kingdom, which goes from bad to worse. It, the ministry of Elijah, Elisha is there. It goes all the way to the death of Jehu, uh, Israel's tenth king. 
And the, the, the book actually alternates the annals between the northern and southern kingdoms. You have to watch it. Be careful. To the to chapters 11 to 17, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea prophesy in these days. We'll talk about them when you get there. And uh, there's a, this go, it goes all the way to the, to the wipeout. I call it the Assyrian captivity, but the nation is gone from that point on there. And the annals of Judah, the southern kingdom, go from chapters 18 to 25. And that's when Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah prophesied. So we've got a lot of, quite a few prophets there. There's eight of them that prophesied essentially to the southern kingdom. And it ends, of course, with the Babylon captivity, which is... Di- the southern kingdom has only 70 years of captivity. They come back. The Assyrians, the, the uh, northern kingdom does not, as, as that entity at least. And uh, now Elisha does receive Elijah's mantle. He wanted to. He, tried, he followed him around. Elijah tried to shake him. He's always there. He says, if my mantle falls on you, you have it. And, he, and when he gets translated, the mantle falls on Elisha. And he decides a double portion. That's interesting when you study the career of Elisha. Elijah did eight miracles. Elisha has 16 recorded. So he got his double portion. But uh, some different, interesting. Elijah is very similar to John the Baptist. There's a, simple, a similar parallel between them. Elisha is a little softer. He, he does a lot of healing acts. He has gentler words. He brings, he ma- brings life out of death. So there's a, some people make a compa- you know, contrast there. But uh, I want to give you one glimpse, because it's meaningful to all of us, of unseen warfare in 2 Kings 6. The king of Syria is warring against the king of Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, meaning Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not in such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. In other words, Elisha uses a prophetic gift to the advantage of the king of Israel every time the king of Syria does this. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once or twice. In other words, this happens a number of occasions. So much so that we get to verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said, them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, the king of Syria thinks he's got a mole on his staff. Somehow, king of Israel is always tipped off. Whenever he sets a trap, they, they elude it. And he, he thinks it's, there's a leak. There's a security problem here. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O my king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. This is the first recorded occasion of a phone tap. Okay. So the king, obviously the king says, Go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And I was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. Dothan's quite an interesting place. That's where uh, uh, Joseph was sold and so forth. And, but anyway, uh, so there's a little village there. And so the king of Syria goes, and he, the, therefore he, he, he sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city round about. So get the picture. In this little village, Elisha and his servant are living. And suddenly the entire Syrian army is surrounding this place. One morning they wake up. And when the servant of the man of God, that's, that's Elisha's servant, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, unto Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's in panic. Looks out there and, you know, he can hear them rubbing their engines. I mean, it's, it's close stuff. He answered, Elisha says, he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And I sort of presume that the servant sort of, yeah, 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 but they're, they're, they're there. I mean, he's, you know, that sounds like a textbook answer, doesn't it? Well, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. I almost imagine him being frustrated. This day. Okay, Father, show him. Show him the, let him know. Let, let him in on it, so to speak. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. This is one of those little glimpses into another dimension. This is a little glimpse that there is power around us we don't see. There is warfare around us we don't see. We need to understand that. Um, those of you that use a word processor, how many of you use word processor on a computer? You know that when you're writing a letter or something, there's all kinds of things happening you don't want to be bothered with. You know, where the margins are, how, where the tab is set, uh, what font it is, whether it's underlined, bold. Normally, you don't care. You just want to get the letter written. But there are times when you want to deal with the formatting a little bit. 
And so there's usually a key, it's a reveal codes key. If you hit that key, all these things going on behind show up in different colors. The margins and the tabs and the instructions as to what font, to, you know, all those little codes are in there. And sometimes you want to be able to diddle those. See, that's our problem in life. What we need in life sometimes is a reveal codes key. That's what Elisha did. He put the button, pushed the button, so to speak, and, uh, and the servant saw what he normally doesn't see, th that they're protected by spiritual forces. And uh, Daniel 10, of course, deals a great deal with that. We'll get there in later in this review. But, um, so what are we up against? Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may able to, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says that twice, by the way, in this passage. But he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Oh, that's interesting. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he's not talking about politics or, or governmental things here. He's talking about these, the, in the Greek, these are ranks of angels. What we wrestle against are spiritual be beings that are adverse to us, that are incredibly powerful. The host of Satan. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you need to go into uh, Ephesians 6 and understand what the armor is and so forth. But there, anyway, getting back to our history here, the northern kingdom had 19 kings reigned 250 years, seven different dynasties. They finally go into the Assyrian captivity in 7021, never to return. The southern kingdom, Judah, had 20 kings reigned about 370 years. In other words, they got an extra century. They didn't learn enough in that extra century. You'd think they would have learned from the, the plight of the northern kingdom, but they didn't. And, uh, they had, but they only had one dynasty. The northern kingdom had seven different dynasties. The southern kingdom had one dynasty, the dynasty of David. Bad or worse, they were all Davidic. But they ultimately get put into the Babylonian captivity, but only for 70 years because of God's commitment to David. They do come, that was there for some reasons we'll come to. But... Uh, and if you, if you go through all these kings and so forth, um, you'll discover that uh, the, they're, they're, uh, the, the, northern king, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse and finally gets wiped out and uh, for 250 years up to 721. And the, the southern kingdom lasts an extra century roughly and goes into captivity, comes back from the captivity and we'll see that when we get to Ezra and Nehemiah and so forth. And we could talk about some, there were some good kings, no good kings in the northern kingdom there were a handful of pretty, not so bad ones in the, in the southern kingdom. Um, and uh, Hezekiah, Josiah being most notable. But uh, D David is a standard of measure and God's faithfulness and preservation uh, all the way through. Uh, death of Azaziah, Joash is preserved from the usurper's sword by Jehoshaphat. Again and again there are plots to wipe out the line and again and again and again there's one that's saved. Joash was saved. And childless Hezekiah under the Assyrian sage, and the blood curse upon Jeconiah was bypassed, and all these things are things we'll talk about later. But uh, the object lessons were ignored. You know, it's interesting, Hegel is famous for saying the history of man teaches us that man learns nothing from history. And that's tragically true. With the exception of Hezekiah and Josiah, the downgrade in Judah just continued. Hezekiah was the greatest since David and Solomon. Manasseh just, the, just was among the wickedness and longest reigning. It was during his reign that the Ark of the Covenant is slipped out of the country to protect it, down to under Pharaoh Necho in Egypt, and that starts a whole other line of the story. But, so, the captivity of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem are emphatically ascribed to the sovereign hand of Jehovah, or Yahweh, or however you want to say the name of God. And, uh, the price of compromise. You know, Reuben and Gad and half tribe Manasseh had settled east of the Jordan. You remember that in the Torah? And uh, they were the first to go into captivity in 1 Chronicles 5. Thirteen years later, the other tribes of the northern kingdom are also deported to Assyria. The Assyrians appear to have been the most inventive of torture cruelties. And I won't go through all that, but they really invented torture. And... Uh, so the, they also had a policy of replanting their captives in other areas so they would lose their national identity. The captives may not have been killed, but their identity was because they would crisscross their captives where they, throughout their entire empire, not just the region, throughout their entire empire. So there's no return for, from exile for the entity called North, Northern Kingdom. So the Ten Lost Tribes is a non-biblical myth that many people are involved with. The Levites emigrate to the south according to Second Chronicles 11. The faithful from all twelve migrate to the south, the scripture tells us. Idol worships, we can infer, migrated to the north. 
and, uh, where it was politically correct. In any case, they were all freed by the Persians in 536 B.C. in any case. All twelve tribes are evident in post-exile records. That's something that most people don't realize. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah deal with all of this. In New Testament, too, we find James and Peter deal with all twelve tribes. So the Chronicles really parallels what we've just said with an emphasis on Judah. And uh, the first book of Chronicles talks about the ho house of Jehovah. And it has Israel's main genealogies, Adam to Jacob, Jacob to David, David to Zedekiah, and the tribal allotments. And it's interesting, the tribe of Dan is missing. Strange. It's there, but not really. It's a very strange passage. There's a whole story about that, but we'll take that at another time. Of course, then the, the last part of it is that David's reign at Jerusalem, where he's anointed the Ark of the Lord, where he brings it in correctly, and he get, learns that lesson. The covenant of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. These are all issues in Chronicles. The second Chronicles is Solomon's 40 years reign, a recap of all of that. His early establishment, building temple, all his glory. And then the last part, the last uh, uh, two-thirds of it, is the division of the kingdom, the 20 kings of Judah, and the deportation of Babylon, setting the stage for Ezra and Nehemiah. Now next time, next session, we'll take the poetical books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of so Songs, a whole different kind of survey uh, for our next session. And I read it.